In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the Jewish population in Europe, and uh, we're going to call this the age of the European ghetto, and I think you probably already have some ideas and familiarity with this history and the story of the Jewish people in Europe. And I guess we'll start with uh, this slide. Uh, where did most Jewish people live, and why was this the case? Uh, another question, why were the Jewish people in Western Europe restricted to the ghetto? And last, can you predict how knowledge of this background, that is the Jewish population in the 18th century, will be useful when we get to the 20th century. And there again, that idea of making connections across of time. So let's get started here. Uh, and here we have a, a chart that I think helps us uh, get a sense of where the Jewish population was, geographically speaking. And you can see that Poland, Ukraine, and the Lithuanian uh, areas have upwards of 3 million Jews. The Habsburg Austrians have 150,000 Jews. German territories, that is the non-Habsburg, that is non-Austrian territories, have about 100,000 Jews. France has 40,000 Jews. England and the Dutch Republic both have less than 10,000 Jews. So clearly we see that the Jewish population in Europe in the 18th century is concentrated in the eastern areas of Europe, that is, again, east of the Elba River that we saw with the peasants that we talked about the other day. And that tells us uh, uh, that the Jewish population is going to be subjected to very different conditions than w existed in the Western areas. However, there are Jews in Western Europe, and we're going to begin to look at those. Uh, no, actually, we're going to look at the uh, Jewish population topic one in the Eastern areas. So I apologize for that. So we're going to start with Catherine the Great of Russia. No, no, and no. And what do I mean by that? Well, Catherine the Great of Russia, uh, herself a German princess who married Peter III, the Russian Tsar, who then was assassinated under mysterious circumstances, though historians suspect that Catherine and her lover, a man named Count Orloff, helped orchestrate this assassination, and then Catherine uh, is able to rule as the Tsarina of Russia for a number of years. And she was a very influential ruler, and we'll encounter her uh, again in subsequent talks. But uh, what does the no, no, no refer to? Well, it refers to the fact that Catherine the Great had excluded Jews from a general invitation that she issued uh, to foreigners, uh, encouraging them to come to settle Russia. So Catherine is aware, uh, like her uh, predecessor, one of her predecessors, Peter the Great, that Russia was sort of behind uh, the times in terms of the development of industry, the development of a capitalistic society that helped to transform Western Europe. This was not happening. And, and one of the things that Catherine uh, came upon was this policy of encouraging immigration to Russia to help Russia move itself along and advance itself. But she excluded Jews. Uh, and, and so there are very few Jews in Russia. However, what we're going to see is the partition of Poland, something I've mentioned several times. Poland's actually going to disappear after having been one of the largest uh, kingdoms in terms of territory. It's going to disappear. It's going to be absorbed by Russia, Prussia, and Austria over uh, a time period 1772 to 1795 in what's known as the partition of Poland. So Russia, Prussia, and Austria are emerging absolutist states in Eastern Europe, and they're going to actually uh, see it, seize the opportunity to carve up a weak state. And remember, Poland had an elected king and very much was a weak state. Uh, what that does, though, is all of a sudden, uh, Russia in particular is going to absorb many of the Jews that lived in Poland and the Ukraine and Lithuania. And this uh, was going to become, over time, a sense of tension and great dispute that would threaten the rule and stability of Catherine in Russia. And again, we see, once again, religion is going to stir up the pot of hatred and discord that we saw with the wars of religion that followed the Reformation. So that's topic number one, Jews uh, in, in Russia now. Um, topic number two, uh, what was it like for Jews living in Europe? In other words, what rights and privileges did Jewish people enjoy? And it would seem that Jews living in Europe did not have or enjoy the same rights and privileges as Christians, uh, unless a, an enlightened monarch specifically granted Jews such rights, which did happen on occasion, but that was not the general rule. Uh, and why would monarchs, especially ones that claim to be enlightened, now we haven't studied the enlightenment yet, we're about to get to it, but the enlightenment preached toleration and the extension of 
rights uh, that, de that derive from natural law, why would these rights be denied to Jews? And this is a, an age-old question, and it's not easily answered. Uh, but certainly over the 1,500 years of European history, we see that Jews have always been the target of resentment, of misunderstanding, of isolation, of expulsion, uh, and, and just generally speaking, unfair treatment because of their religion. And here you see a, a Jewish man in his workshop at home uh, uh, performing uh, some kind of scientific investigations. And that is to remind us that Jews actually contributed uh, when they could and where they could a great deal to European society, despite the fact that they were uh, not going to be treated equally. In fact, Jews, Jews were often considered by European nations and their leaders to be resident aliens, resident aliens. And I don't know if that sounds familiar to you uh, with today's discussion of immigrants, both in Europe and in the United States, that we have these aliens that, uh, and we talk about illegal aliens in the United States in particular. Well, Jews that lived in uh, Europe, in, at least in Western Europe, uh, and in Russia as well, in Eastern Europe, were considered resident aliens. Uh, and they could be deported at any time if the monarch felt that it was in the national interest to do so. So monarchs uh, and emperors, empresses, uh, had the ability to enact policies that would remove these resident aliens if they felt that the nation's interests were at stake. Keep that in mind. As I said, how does this history help us understand the 20th century. Keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing um, we're going to look at is the idea that Jews were considered by laws and by custom, uh, normative custom, um, to be socially and religiously and culturally inferior to Christians. Let me repeat that. By law and by custom, the norms, that is, that uh, govern human societies, considered Jewish people to be inferior socially religiously and culturally. Uh, and that meant that Jewish people were going to be excluded from active participation in political life and in the institutions of these emerging states. Think about the great bureaucracy in France or in England uh, with a parliamentary system or uh, the bureaucracies that begin to grow in Prussia uh, and especially in Prussia the military and in Austria and in Russia as well. Uh, Jews are simply going to be, be simply put be barred from participating. Um, they could also not serve in the military uh, and I mentioned they could not serve in the royal bureaucracies and so they're really excluded from any avenue of upward social mobility that becomes increasingly common uh, as the 18th century progresses. So what are the possible uh, explanations that help us understand uh, choices that leaders and society made regarding Jewish people? Well, again, I think it's the idea resident aliens and also fear of the other, a uh, 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 topic that we see today. Why is it that we fear immigrants? Why is it that we fear people from certain areas of the world? And that's because we fear them for their otherness. And, and the otherness is rooted in religion. Uh, the Jews uh, do not believe in the New Testament. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that is the Savior of humankind. And so, therefore, they're going to be targeted, uh, even though um, um, Christians uh, came from the Jewish faith itself. And this is kind of an interesting thing. And if you have questions about that, please ask in class. But I want to get to the last uh, topic. To uh, No, actually, the third topic and then the last topic. And quickly, that is the idea of the ghetto and the appearance of the ghetto in towns and cities in the West. Um, the ghettos began in Venice, Italy. Uh, and ghetto itself, ghetto in Italian, is one of the many islands that make up the city of Venice. And it was an island that had a foundry on it, that is an ironworks that would make cannon or other iron objects. And it was on this little island uh, called Ghetto that Jews were forced to live. And that is, they're segregated from the rest of the population. So uh, when we talk about Jews in Western Europe, they're going to be increasingly herded into or forced into the areas of city that are res reserved solely for Jewish people. And they took the Italian word ghetto and applied it. We call it ghetto today. Now, of course, Jews living in Eastern Europe, where there's lots of open space and land, lived in villages and areas that were reserved for Jewish people. So in, in Russia, we talk about the pay area that is populated with Jewish people that relocated from Western Europe as they were excluded, as Jews were excluded in prior uh, centuries. Um, now, uh, Jews mostly, for the most part, lived uh, in poverty or near poverty. They worked in the lower, that is, less desirable occupations. 
uh, they were unable to move about freely. Uh, and we're talking about Jews both in cities and in eastern villages. They were not able to move about freely. They had to ask permission, in fact, from authorities, either town or village authorities, to relocate uh, and to travel about. And often authorities denied such requests. Therefore, Jewish life uh, was severely restricted in terms of opportunity. And in response, Jewish communities became very tight-knit, almost like the peasant communities, very tight-knit support groups. Uh, they worked as a group, as a body, to help protect uh, and preserve their identity. Uh, they were also very suspicious of outsiders, uh, naturally, just as peasants were. They were suspicious of political authority. Oh, I wonder why. Well, because authorities had so mistreated them and not uh, granted them uh, recognition and the same rights as Christians. And this really, uh, this idea that the Jewish communities become very tight-knit and that is closed and suspicious of outs outsiders really reinforces the Christian notion that Jews, in fact, were different. And really, how fair is that? So there's this perpetuation of the idea that becomes the myth uh, that, that exists in European society uh, from very early on uh, all the way through the 20th century, as I said at the beginning of this lecture. So that's something to continue. And, and here in this picture, you can see in one of the towns of Europe, I don't know which one, but you can see the uh, Jewish ghetto uh, or ghetto uh, that was reserved uh, for Jews and Jewish businesses and shops, etc. Uh, the last thing we're going to look at Jewish contributions. Um, and there were several families that did emerge out of the 17th century merchant revolution that amassed a great deal of wealth, which then they used to form and found banks. And then as bankers and financiers, they were able to loan large sums of money to monarchs and governments to finance various projects in the 18th and 19th century. And these various projects inevitably revolved around war, that is, creating vast armies and arming them, equipping them to then go and fight these wars that were quite frequent in the 18th century uh, and in the beginning part of the 19th century. Uh, and one of the most famous but now forgotten was Samuel Oppenheimer, uh, who helped finance the Habsburg Wars, uh, the Austrian Habsburgs, against the Ottoman Turks. And in fact, the uh, Habsburgs are able to defeat the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and it led to the surrender of the Ottoman Turks in the 1699 Treaty of Karlovitz and allowed uh, Austria to expand into Hungary and to secure its southern borders from the Turkish uh, menace, if you will. Uh, so uh, there's another family that uh, we're, you should look up and we will look up and talk about, and that's the Rothschild family that came out of uh, Germany uh, and was able to become one of the wealthiest families, in fact, all, in all of Europe, uh, creating ba a banking network that rivaled the Medici network of the Renaissance in the 15th century. So um, the contributions of Jewish people uh, were there. Uh, far and few between uh, at this time, though they will begin to uh, grow and evolve and become more and more part of European nations as those nations begin to solidify, in particular uh, in Germany and uh, Austria and other areas of Europe, uh, Eastern Europe that is. Okay, so with that, uh, we're done with this lecture. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please write them down and, and hopefully you can begin to see uh, the information and background knowledge of Jewish people in the 18th century will help us better understand uh, the history of the 20th century, and I really mean the rise of Nazi Germany and then the ultimate Holocaust, the, the terrible history of that time period. And I hope this uh, helps us in that regard. So thank you very much.